more lore breaking, more cheesy writing, along with some stunning visual effects and some other stuff that is good and bad. Welcome back to the next episode in the Rings of Power series. I'm Tim Anderson, a.k.a. Renfail, the Bearded Dwarven Princess. And along with the Rings of Power rant and discussion videos, I, of course, am reviewing the show. And up on the chopping block today is episode four, which, for better or for worse, is the next episode in the series. Now, remember, if you've never tuned into one of my episodes before, I do two reviews at the end of this. One is the biased review, where I look at it through the eyes of a Tolkien fan who enjoys the lore of the world and the lore of the Second Age, and I analyze and discuss all of the things that Amazon is doing that destroys the lore and the ways that they are potentially following the lore. We also discuss these things in the Mondays in Middle Earth show. There will be a link up here somewhere. Those episodes go live every Monday at 11 a.m. as I read through The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, and The Silmarillion to break down things about The Rings of Power and to re-educate myself on the book series that I hadn't read for 20 years. The other review is the review through the eyes of an unbiased fan who just likes fantasy shows. And this is my wife. My wife has never read the books. She's watching this show with me, much like she did with The Wheel of Time. Have her never read those books either. Um, and the way that she views this show, the review that she gives it. If you've never seen Chris during one of my live streams, feel free to hop in and talk to her about it then. Uh, but... Again, two reviews at the end of this. One is the biased fan view, and the other is the unbiased general fantasy. Like, what is this show? How does it compare to other fantasy shows? Before we dive into the review, of course, this is the part where I have to say thanks to all of these people here who are supporting here on YouTube and over on Patreon. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon so you get future updates in the series to support the channel drop a super thanks down below two bucks five bucks whatever or join as a member of the adventurers guild more information at the end about all the other stuff in the meantime we're going to get right into the show notes here so uh reviewing things at the very end talking about things up until then if you're new here if you're not you know the drill let's roll so we start off uh with the Kreen regent having some sort of uh, vision here um she's doing a naming ceremony from women with newborn children. The dialogue's a little bit cheesy. There's like an earthquake. She appears to be very nervous as she turns, and there's panic in her eyes as the white tree starts to shed its petals. There's a nasty wind that comes in, and here come the tsunamis and tidal waves, and we can see the island of Numenor going under, and the ocean is sweeping in and covering the island, and these visuals are absolutely stunning. Now, this is obviously a dream slash vision because she wakes up from it after that. Um... And because I've seen in the previews, we know that she has access to a Palantir, which is going to come up later on in the episode. But if you didn't know this from watching the previews, you would be like, is she having a vision of the future? Or sort of. Yeah. More about that later. Um, we get this uh, scene out in the streets where you've got people who are speaking out against the elves because they don't need to sleep. They don't need to rest. They're going to take our jobs, etc. The queen must be an elf lover, just like her father. And so they're basically fomenting dissent against the elves. And uh, Ferrazon is using this to establish and helps himself as a man who's going to keep Numenor free of the elves. Galadriel is no threat. She's just one elf. Trust me. So he's obviously campaigning for leadership here, even though he's not yet the leader. And those of us who know the lore... Well, we know at least where he's going in the future, and assuming they hold true to that, um, there is a reason that, that he is campaigning in this way uh, at this point in time. Um, we then get uh, this new scene um, where Galadriel is talking to the queen, and the, chewing, <clears throat> the queen is chewing Galadriel out about all these things. And, and this, is, <laughs> this is basically just Galadriel saying that, you know, Halbrand is this important VIP that you need to release and back him because that's going to inspire others to raise uh, an army in the south and we need to um, bring the armies of Numenor to reforge the Alliance Poon Elves and you're going to, I need you to sail with me back to Middle-earth and we're going to save the lands of the south from Sauron before he can claim them for his own. The queen says no. And Galadriel goes on about this thing about not all Numenor agrees, which means she's fomenting dissent as well, not respecting the laws of the people who are not her own. Again, I hate Galadriel at this point. I really do. She's a freaking bitch. Like, 
She doesn't respect anybody. She doesn't respect her own king. She doesn't respect other people's kings and queens. It's literally, I'm a selfish, egotistical bitch who just wants my agenda. Um, which honestly, isn't this what all the woke people wanted? Uh, the the you know, and and this is the the one time I'll say I have not seen any woke agenda from the show, and I still haven't seen her come out as, you know, a woke character. But there are aspects of this that. I'm beginning to understand why people are, you know, having an outcry against Galadriel because this whole concept of she's just, she's the only one who can see it. She's the strong, independent woman and she's the only one who's capable. No, she's just being a bitch. Like she, screw destiny for a minute. She's just being a selfish, egotistical bitch to everyone around her. This is not admirable, you know, She's she's not doing admirable things here. These are not qualities to admire in a person. She's just being contrary at every single turn. It's annoying. Stop it. It's unnecessary. Welcome to jail. You deserved it. <laughs> like, you deserved it, bitch. Sedition. Like, you were fomenting sedition. Like, she's in jail now. Happy to see it. Um, Isildur's off having daydreams on the boat again, you know, who knows what he's thinking about dreaming of the West or whatever gets, you know, one of those friends screws up. He tries to take the blame. The boat captain kicks them all off. Now his friends are pissed. Call him an elf lover. All you care about is the true Numenor in the West. And you're always brooding over your old mother. We're just setting this up because he needed to get kicked off of the sea ship for what comes later in the episode. So storytelling 101, this is a cliche. Um, now we're back to the prisoners. Uh, Arondir is here. The elves are bowing down. And this is a very, honestly, a, a extremely intriguing scene because we meet Adar for the first time. And he's obviously a fallen elf. Now, he's being called father by the orcs. And Arondir asks him, why are you being called father? And there's this scene where he leans down over one of the orcs that was injured during the fight as Erendu was trying to break out and he's got tears in his eyes and the elf the, the orc is looking up at him with devotion and he puts it out of its misery and he's crying the whole time and he, he turns around and has this conversation about you know where were you born Arendir oh yes i was there when i was young i remember those days um and and are we going back to this? Because in the original text, there is this allusion to Melkor created, you know, Morgoth created the first elf, the uh, first orc through torturing elves, and that's how the orcs were created. And they call him, you know, father is what they're essentially calling him with the the name that they've given him. So, is he the first orc? It'd be interesting if he was, and it would be kind of a cool element. Like, this is one part I actually look at and go, that would be kind of cool if they did. Like, this is one element of the storyline that I'm actually looking at going, I can I, I can kind of get behind this. If, this. if this guy is, like, the first orc, and he's been out there creating his army of orcs, you know, through other means. And he, but he makes this line about how... Um, you have been told many lies. Some run so deep, even the rocks and roads now believe them. And then he does the thing about, I am no god, at least not yet. So why would he say that? Interesting stuff here. Um, he then releases Arendir to deliver a message back to town. So, of course, this is how Arendir is going to live to see another day. And then we're back with the townsfolk. Bronwyn is complaining about food. Theon offers to go steal some from the old cellar. His mom's like, no, you can't do that. Um, and he basically tells her, screw you, mom. And he goes off and does it anyway, convinces his friend to go with him. Um, they get to the deserted town. They get some supplies out. Of course, they get attacked. Now, this is where the kid literally has the sword hill and he picks it up and stabs it into his arm and lets the blood flow. And it creates this blade. And the orc is like, oh, I know that. Give it to me chases the kid down theon hides in a well and then the orc starts shouting i found it i found it the boy has the hilt so this is what the orcs have been searching for the whole time is this sword for some reason they've been searching for this sword um and now that they know they've seen it it's a little chaos to try to find it um I can wait. <laughs> uh, we get a scene with Celebrimbor and elrond looking out over the construction of the tower Dwarves and elves working together, so work is progressing, but uh, Durin is nowhere to be seen. Haven't seen him in days. There's this... You know, I understand why they're doing it from a story-building perspective, but there's this whole sequence of 
Durin hasn't been seen in days. Elrond wants to find out why. He confronts Disa. Disa gives him the runaround. Oh, he's out doing quartz mining, and and you know, uh, he won't be here for days. And and Elrond's like, well, if he's mining quartz, why is his chisel still on the wall? And if he's out for days, why are you preparing his favorite meal? And she gives him a line of BS, and 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 then Elrond's like, okay, you know, all right, all right. And then flash forward to the next sequence, and she's on the ramparts meeting with Durin and they're talking about, Oh, I hope the elf bought the lie and everything else. And of course, Elrond's back in the, in the wings spying on them and reading lips and finds out there's something going down in the, in the old mines. And so he goes there and um, confronts Durin. Durin accuses of him spying. Uh, that's the real reason you were sitting here is to spy on me. Um, Elrond makes him swear an oath uh, at this point and says, I'm going to show you something, swear an oath on the stone. And if you break it, Dwarven fury will follow you and your kin until the ends of time. Which makes me wonder, are they going to tie in the bad relationships between the elves and the dwarves based on Elrond letting slip that they have Mithril? Don't know where they're going with this, but, you know, uh, Durin reveals the secret to uh, Elrond. There's a cave in. Um, Yeah. <laughs> I'm reading here. I, I have a line here that I wrote myself. I could give two shits about the son of Farazone and the daughter of Elendil. It feels like a forced relationship and totally invented, probably to bring together an elf lover and one who does not. We'll see if that pans out in the storyline later on. The jail cell conversation that we get to next is interesting because Halbrand is basically... Finally, someone is confronting Galadriel and being like, you need to stop. Like, you're just being stupid. You're galloping into things like a horse. And she's like, did you just compare me to a horse? And he's like, yeah, I did, because you're acting stupid. And you need to realize that, you know, use the weaknesses of your enemy against them. And maybe the reason that you confronted the, you confronted the queen and made demands to see her father, uh, maybe that's the reason why she threw you in the jail cell. Use that to your advantage. And then she, of course, tries to break out. Photozone is there. He goes to like defend himself and like try to capture her. And Halbrand's like, "No, don't." And Photozone, well, I can't just let her go free. And 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 Halbrand says, "You don't have to worry about that if you know where she's going to be going." So is he, is he like going to give Photozone information on where Galadriel's going? I don't know. Isildur and his sister at the bar crying about fate. The guards run by. The elf has escaped, and we see Galadriel breaking into the queen's tower. The queen's here. He's bedridden and dying. Galadriel, Galadriel is demanding to know why she's no longer the queen. Dem Galadriel is demanding to know why the queen is no longer loyal to the elves if her father was. And there's this whole sequence of the queen explaining, you know, that her father wanted to return to the old ways, but the people rebelled. Um, the queen was named Regent, and that's when her father showed him, uh, showed her the Palantir, and um, gave her this vision of, of what would befall if they pissed the Eldar off, which is why her father was wanting to return to the old ways, because he knew that if they uh, pissed off the, the Valar and and everybody else then if they, basically her father was looking in the, the Palantir and having these visions and realizing that if we if we if we go against the elves, if we go against the Valar, the island's going to go up in smoke. And so we need to return to the old ways. But the people didn't want to go to the old ways. The people don't want to be beholden to the elves. So there's this sequence where Galadriel's like, oh, I know what a Palantir is. And, and she goes to touch it, and the queen's like, no, but you've never seen one like this. And then, of course, Galadriel gets the vision. And this is another... I'm just... Again, Galadriel will not let this lie there's this vision of the island falling Galadriel doesn't give a shit she's literally all she talks about here is come on queen go with me to middle earth save your people if we fight Sauron it won't matter that your island is going to go under because we'll fight Sauron and we'll defeat him and yay Sauron what a selfish bitch mm. Another sequence that I fast forwarded here, which is Theon escaping the village. I just fast forward all of this. This is a cliche completely across the board. Um, until, of course, Arondir rescues him. They're running through the forest. We finally see the Arondir three finger reverse draw, which drives me nuts. And they make it out of the forest. Bronwyn's there. Uh, sunlight's coming down. The orcs don't chase them anymore because they've made it back. Um, 
Next scene, I actually, even though this is stolen from like Dragon Age, the scene where Disa is singing to the rocks, I gotta say, this was pretty cool. Like, visually and just, just this was a cool fantasy sequence. Um, I really like this. And, and, and there's this whole sequence of Durin raving about, you know, the fact that his father, father shut down the mine shaft because it's too dangerous to mine for Mithril. And he's, he's you know, I want to return, you know, I want to be able to rebel against the old man. And we finally get a lore snippet here because Elrond talks about his father uh, who sailed, you know, through and would use the power of one of the Silmarils to get back to uh, the island to convince the Valar to fight against Morgoth. And as a result, they put him in the sky as like the evening star to guide people for eternity. And, and Elrond talks about, you know, being able to live up to that legacy and, at the very least, he says, you know, you still have your father here. You should make amends to him and be grateful for those conversations. And it's, 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 it's a it's a heartwarming, if cliched, moment between two friends. But I thought it was done fairly well. Um, uh, th there's a sequence here. Bronwyn's talking to Arendir. Oh, the guy is coming, saying that if you if, you, if your people forsake their claim to the lands and swear fealty to him, Adar... Um, you can live. Otherwise, he's coming for Ostirith. Here's the sequence that we saw in the trailer, which I was always confused about, which is the old man confronts Theon, throws a flask down on the ground, says, you deserve it, boy, for what you did saving our people. And that flask has the symbol that Halbrand has on his neck piece, which is the symbol of the old king who served under Morgoth. And um, then he sits down. He's like, I know what you did. You stole the sword from my barn. And he shows him a mark on his arm, right? Which is the same mark that Theon has from plunging the sword into his wrist, apparently. Um, or he goes to like, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, this is this sequence here where he's telling the kid that, um, you know, beautiful Sauron who created this sword for our ancestors you've seen the signs in the sky he's coming back and this is all gonna you know save your strength because we're gonna need it um but this is also I just had a sudden theory that spun up in my head because the kid has the sword he's using the sword everything else is this Halbrin's bastard son I don't know ladies and gentlemen I'm looking at my notes looking up at you like is this Halpern's bastard son? Is this the guy who ran out on Bronwyn? And that's who this kid is because he's a descendant of the old kings through Halbrand, and that's how he can use the sword. Or is the sword does the sword use the blood of anyone? Or does the sword only use the blood of the descendants of the old king? I have a feeling that this is going to be. Um, I, ha I have a feeling this is Halbrand's bastard son. I really do. It's just a theory, but I think it. I think it is. Um, back to the island, Ferrazon is congratulating the queen on sending Galadriel away by boat, and as they go to make the announcement from the to the people, the petals of the tree start falling down. The queen sees this; she starts freaking out. Elendil sees this as well. He's looking at the queen with doom in his eyes because they both believe that these are the tears of the Valar falling because they're about to make a mistake. So now the queen goes to give a different speech to the people, and she basically has decided that she's going to personally escort Galadriel to join Middle Earth, and to, to, to Middle Earth to join the war. And they're going to go. Uh, she's released Halbrun from jail. Um, they're going to join forces with Halbrun's people, and they're going to go to war against Sauron. Um, and this is where there's a call going out. Isildur raises his hand and says, "I will join," and his father sees him. Um, so. Now, this is where I got to get to the review part of this. So, from a Tolkien lore perspective, this episode breaks lore in so many ways. And very quickly, before I even dis you know dissect all of this, I'm giving this one from a lore perspective um, about the same as last week, a five out of ten. Um, it didn't go down. It didn't go up. Uh, it stays about the same because they're breaking a lot of lore. But they also had some like I did like the Adar thing. That was kind of a cool throw uh, to, um, you know, Morgoth corrupting the first elves and then those elves becoming the orcs. Like, I don't know what's going on with Adar there, but I'm interested to see that. Um, so there's some cool lore stuff that happened here, but there's also some stuff that if it weren't for the cool stuff, it would have dropped it a little bit more. But I thought that there were, there were some throwbacks to some of the, the existing lore that were very good, like Elrond's father. These are high notes. And... 
these little high notes could have driven the lower score a little bit higher, but then we also have things that draw it lower. Like, for example, Queen Muriel was not the one who went to war against the forces of Sauron. All right, It was Farazon. And in the lore of the book Farazon, as we know, he's the one who went out there and waged war and got rich, captured Sauron, brought him back, Sauron corrupted him, and he's the one who went to war against the Valar. So this goes back to what we were talking about in the earlier on in the episode. We see him campaigning this anti-elf mentality um, because he wants to be king one day, and 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 that's going to come back. We know it's going to come back because he has to be. He 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 is the one who ends up at least in the book. And I don't know if they're going to make Muriel at fault for this or not, but Muriel is doing what she's doing to try to save Numenor from going under. She believes that if she, if she helps Galadriel, she can avoid the fate of this, the island going under. So breaking lore like this um, in lots of different ways while adhering to it in other places, it just makes for a jumbled mess as a, from a lore perspective. So from a lore um, viewpoint, I give this a five out of 10. Now let's talk about the generic fantasy show. Again, we've got cliches, we've got some things going on, but this is an episode where I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10 for like a general fantasy episode. The flow went very well. There were some really good sequences in here with the Elrond and Durin, the Mithril scene, the Disa, the stone resonation sequence. Um, we've got some really cool stuff with the Numenorean views and the visuals. And I, I kind of like at the end when, you know, we can see where, where even though, again, it's breaking the lore that's established, we can also see that um, from a lore perspective, uh, you know, we, we have Ellen Deal who's going to become more than just a boat captain. Um, now, it, the thing with Ellen Deal is, is it's in the previous, well, I'm getting into all the previous lore where they, where they break things. Um, basically, um, Ellen Deal is a pretty badass character and they're, they're doing things with him that aren't exactly true to lore. But from the show perspective, he's one of the few characters in the show that I'm really liking the way he's being portrayed from a generic fantasy standpoint. So I really like the sequences of him, and I like the way this is going to work out for him. I see where they're going with him and his son. We also have the other son, Anorian, who was cast out because of his belief in the old ways and wanting to follow the elves. And you know he's going to come back around now, because now that they're joining forces with the elves, Anorian becomes a very important figure alongside uh, Isildur and underneath Elendil, because they become the first kings of everything, essentially. Um, so from a, from a fantasy standpoint... Um, very good episode, uh, good storytelling here. Some cliches, but the sort of looking forward to what's going to happen with the sword and everything else, and Sauron coming back, and, and the orcs looking out for the blade, and now Adar, and coming back, and everything else. We're getting breadcrumb reveals, which from a storytelling perspective work. They work in television like this. So knowing that we're about halfway, I think we are halfway through the series now, episode four. I think there's only eight episodes. Um, it feels like a good point for a halfway episode. So I think from a storytelling standpoint, generic fantasy show, 7 out of 10. So 5 out of 10 for Malore, 7 out of 10 for general fantasy. Love to hear your thoughts below. Uh, support the channel with a super thanks below. Join the ranks of all of these people by uh, doing a membership here. Or you can also go over to our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash wandering hermits. Links are down below if you want to. Go click on all those things, figure out what my wife and my brother are working on over there with that project. It's a fantasy world video game, book series, and stuff like that. Drop your comments down below. Let's discuss today's episode. And, of course, stay tuned because we have more Rings of Power rants and reviews coming to you next week.